Hello everyone and welcome to this LinkedIn Live on how to negotiate with procurement. Uh, a fascinating topic for the people in sales, but probably also the people in procurement will get a few interesting ideas from this LinkedIn Live. Because with me today, I have the pleasure to have a very experienced procurement professional uh, Nicola Passacan, that will help us to better understand the fascinating world of procurement and how to work effectively with them. Actually, before we go into the topic, uh, Nicola, why don't you say a few words about yourself? Yeah, no, sure. Thanks, thanks, Giuseppe. Uh, hello, everybody. So, my name is Nicola. I've been global head of procurement for a company in technology and information services, uh, leading large international teams for several years. I've got over 20 years of experience driving procurement excellence for global organization. Um, I mainly specialized in indirect procurement and operational improvement, mainly in the services industry, even though I worked before in FMCG and the airline industry. I've as well designed, built and led shared services organization. And I am currently a subject matter expert with Officio, supporting some of their clients in their transformation journey. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nicola. So uh, let's get started. You know, I'm going to kick it off with some of my questions to our audience. We also tell them that, you know, they can also ask questions so that we complement my own question with the one that come from the people that are joining us live. Maybe, you know, to get us started, Nicola, when to negotiate with procurement? <laughs> that, that, that's a very good question to ask before how I think you need to think about when you want to get to procurement and my recommendation would be to get to procurement early on well especially if you think it's going to go down to an RFP uh, to some competitive exercise I think for the salespeople definitely invite procurement early to participate in meetings uh, it's better sooner rather than later you, you are going to get a head start on your competitors if you do that Plus, when it goes down to an RFP, you will have understood already what procurement is looking for. Uh, so don't, don't wait until the proposal is finalized. I think definitely go and, and get linked to procurement. If you've never worked with procurement before in, in the company you are actually dealing with, uh, just ask your stakeholders uh, to introduce you to procurement. I think you'll probably just get granny point by doing that anyway, because later on, it's just not, just going to create more difficulty if we are not involved early. So when? Well, sooner rather than later is, is my recommendation. Okay. And I guess, you know, from, from your message, I also get this idea of uh, if you are early, maybe you can also shape the specification. Maybe you can also uh, influence, you know, the kind of things that will be asked or will not be asked in the RFP, right? No, that, that's a very good point. And I've had actually very successful suppliers doing that to us uh, in different roles, in different parts of the organization. And what you realize is that the, the companies who are currently doing that really well actually will influence the RFP. So they've got additional points when it's about answering the RFP afterwards, because it means that their solutions is going to be more tailored to the requirement which has been uh, constructed. So yes, that's uh, that's something which would definitely be an added value as well for the sales team down the road. Okay, what should you expect from procurement? Um, well, I think <laughs> people in procurement are like just salespeople. Uh, we have managers, we have our goals, we want to be treated with respect, uh, we want to be seen as having done a good job. One of the things which I think um, is important to understand as well is quite often procurement are not specialists of an area. So they don't like feeling exposed uh, for lack of technical expertise or market knowledge. So one of the things is we are all human beings. We want to be uh, put into uh, under the sunlight. So make sure you don't expose people when, when you actually have those conversations. Just, just procurement are normal people. And even sometimes we, we have goals that might mean that the relationship might be a bit, uh, well, there may be tension, it can be a bit adversarial. I think it's possible to partner with procurement the same way you'd partner with uh, some of your internal stakeholders or stakeholders you'll be working with. So yeah, I think it's really about long-term relationship, treat us as uh, key stakeholders when you go down the road where you've got opportunities and just remember that we've got our own objectives as well, but they are not that different from the business objectives, generally speaking. 
Okay, well, let, let me dig a bit fast, further on this topic about work. I mean, how do you get yourself ready to deal with procurement, right? Um, sort of linked to what I've said, I think it's really about understanding what procurement goals are and how you could help accomplishing those. Uh, definitely getting the best possible price is, is going to be a major objective almost all the time. There is little number of industries where we won't talk about price, even though there might not be the first factors, it's always in the procurement objectives. Now, there is more than that. Uh, it's about risk, it's about operating ethically, it's about financial stability of the suppliers. Uh, how do we measure return on investment? So I think that you need to think about all those points when you get yourself to um, to deal with procurement. It's really about aligning your approach to the procurement perceived objectives. Now, one of the things when you have developed that perceived objective, just make sure that you actually test the procurement person in front of you during your those first meetings. Have those conversations, ask questions, basically, to make sure that you understand where they will be more sensitive, basically, when you go down to your arguments. OK, well, uh... It is important in every negotiation, right, to understand well your counterpart, to try to get as much as possible an insight about what is in their mind, what are their interests and priorities. I mean, how do you determine procurement's role and priorities? Um, well, I think you should start by understanding the industry the company is operating in. Well, the overall growth, the margin, some of the challenges, the perspective of that industry. Uh, then it goes down to the company. It's like, well, go from the top and then go down to understand it. So when you understand the industry, understand the companies are and how it fits into that industry. What their revenue looks like. Is it a growing company? What their results? Are they looking for innovation? What their footprint? Then you go down one more and you start to ask yourself a question about the company objectives, because that's what is going to determine the procurement objectives. So you could find that in a lot of publications of CEO interviews, CFO interviews, look for keywords, basically, things like innovation, organic growth, new product launch would probably mean a procurement sensitivity to well, that kind of things, to innovation, to startups, to proposing new ideas. If you read actually things like automation, simplifications, a geographical footprint that's probably more a focused focus organization if there is anywhere in the world improve cash flow you know that payment term is going to be important for procurement so i think that's that's really what it is about you need to understand the industry the company and then just try to find those keywords those messages that has been given to uh, the market so you understand procurement priorities before you start talking to them it's like well and you are a Pokemon person, Giuseppe, you know that. So when you prepare for negotiation, you try to gather intel. And actually, it's exactly the same as the other side. I think just come prepared and tailor your message uh, to uh, to what you've heard about the company and that industry. Because that's going to help you positioning your offer in the right way. Yeah. I like the advice, you know, let me repeat it also for the audience, you know, from uh, the company communication, you can get insight about what procurement may be, re what may be relevant for procurement. So depending on what the company hot topics are, they may be a good indication about what may be also important for the procurement people. Maybe let me add another spin and other things that you also want to do is understand as much as possible about the individual you are dealing with, right? You know, you are negotiating with a company, you're negotiating with IBM, with SAP, with Carrefour, with uh, Apple or whatever. Uh, having said that, you're also negotiating with John, Pascal, Jürgen, Brigitte, and those individuals have their own interests and priority, etc. So, uh, of course, you know, looking at the LinkedIn profile of the person may be a good start. You know, looking at other social media may also be a way to go more in depth. Let me also share a couple of resources and I'm going to put them in the chat. You know, there are a couple of uh, websites that provide artificial intelligence based personality profile. Let me write it down. One of them is called Humantic. Dot AI. Uh, another is called Crystal Nose. Crystal Nose 
dot com so i'll put again you know crystalnose.com you know those are two websites that provide insight about uh, the personality of people so if i go there and search about nicola passacan because the cpo with whom i'm dealing with then you may get some insight about how the personality of nicola may look like yeah no that, that's a great point i've actually used crystal knowns in the past uh, to deal with suppliers, to deal with some of the CEO or CFO of, our, of some of our larger suppliers. And it's very interesting uh, what it can actually gather as information. And it's all public information that consolidate to build a profile. And that helps you to actually understand if that person is more relationship driven, more facts and data and figures. I think that's a, that's a very, very good point, actually. The person is as important as the company and the overall objective. Perfect. And uh, what does success look like from the perspective of a procurement professional? Um, well, I think it starts by the objective we talked about. But generally speaking, I think the increased savings on the deal is something that procurement professionals are, are going to be measured on. So they will want to see the value created, uh, the return on investment for the business. They will want to look at the innovative solutions provided as well during that um, that process, whether it's a one-to-one -one conversation, uh, one-to-one -one negotiations, or it's a broader RFP. I think accessing innovative solutions is something which uh, would be a success if you could get that, especially if you've got um, the um, the exclusivity of some of those, basically, depending on the industry, that could be actually a great success for procurement uh, to secure to secure um, that kind of elements. Resilience and sustainability uh, becomes more and more important. So success would be as well to ensure that you've got the right uh, quality at the right price at the right time, and you get it over time. So especially when there is crisis, and, and I think coronavirus has been quite an interesting one. I think that's where you actually uh, could really say that some procurement teams have been very successful in securing some of their supplies. So success could be that. Um, and then there is a sort of overall, which quite often is too uh, is overlooked, is really the risk to the organization. Um, success is as well mitig mitigating those risks, uh, reputational damage, operational disruptions, uh, financial stress. I think there is a number of things that are more than just the price itself that are part of what makes a successful procurement person. And then that's th thing go going back to what we talked about earlier on when and how to negotiate with procurement. I think that goes down that road too, to say you need to understand what success look like if you want to deal with the procurement the right way. And in every industry, there are going to be some common factors, uh, some common elements, but then there's as well specificities you need to make sure you look at. Yeah, thank you. Now, you mentioned the first topic, you know, which is a classic of procurement, the savings. I mean, I mean, what is really called the savings by procurement people? Uh, well, do, do we have an hour just on savings definition? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a complicated one. It's every company you are working with. I think that's probably one of the first topics that's going to come in procurement finance conversation. So a savings for finance will be different from what a savings might be defined by a procurement. And, and quite often a supplier is, is really um, very pragmatic about it. Say if I just reduce my price, it's a saving. Uh, well, actually, no, not always. If it's a new product, if it's a new feature, well, actually it might come as a cost avoidance, which is basically we are getting something for free. So we avoid the cost of paying for that feature. But in reality, it's not going to be a cost saving for a procurement. There is a number of definitions. Now, one of the ones which is relatively common across all of the industries is basically when you've got a recurring purchase, you paid 100, the following year you are going to pay 90, the 10 is a saving. Now, obviously, nothing is always as simple as that. Finance is going to come back saying, well, actually, you've got an infl inflation or deflation uh, of X percent, so your saving can't really be about that 10 of difference because you are if the market went down by 20 well actually in 10 is not a cost reduction it's not a saving so that's why you've got that entire complexity around what saving is really about because it's driven by market perspective as well as your internal finance view of it 
Uh, the, the most successful teams I found is where actually there is upfront conversation and agreement in between CFO and CPO around what cost reduction is, around what is a saving, and then to try to keep it as simple as possible. So the team is aligned around that. Yeah. And Nicola, from my experience, also, you know, each organization has a different definition for savings. You know, even though, you know, the broad principle may be the same, then uh, how the people apply the market evolution, the inflation, uh, and what's exactly is considered, you know, as a benchmark, etc., is uh, slightly different from one company to the other. So difficult, really, not to have uh, a benchmark which is really the same across company about uh, I saved 80 millions, it may not mean the same if you work uh, at PNG, if you work uh, at uh, Philips, or if you work uh, at uh, Schneider Electric. No, definitely. And then, well, and, and you know, I worked in private equity as a CPO for several years. And, and what I've seen as well is very different from any industries like you. Well, when you've got a private equity acquiring a company, they just put a business case together and they said, your operating cost is 100 at the end of this year. In two years time, your operating cost need to be 80. So that 20 is going to be saving. Now you always, even two years down the road, you always go back to the initial business case, to the initial operational cost to measure savings, which I find that extremely interesting way to do because you keep the same baseline for the duration of the deal, basically. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. Now, we got you know, the broad understanding about the procurement. I mean, let's go into the negotiation piece. You know, what are some of the common levers used by procurement in negotiation? Um, th there is a number of those. And you said that earlier when we talked about putting our FP together and getting engaged early with procurement. The first thing is really about the specifications is how do you define what you are going to procure is, is extremely important. Uh, quite often in procurement world, you are going to talk about early engagement with stakeholders, but that's exactly about that because a lot of the costs are determined by how you define what you're going to procure. And whether it's services, goods, is relatively similar. The earlier you are involved, the better. So quite often, it starts by specifications. Um, you can tighten it to make more specific. You can broaden it to actually have a number of respondents higher than what you would have if the, uh, the stakeholders is defining it too tightly. So that's one of the elements, is the specifications. The other one is about consolidating spend. Uh, in a lot of companies, you've got multiple sources, and, and one of the levers would be to consolidate that spend. So instead of having 10 suppliers, you end up with two. So you are actually benefiting from some leverage from your volume. That, that's another one. Um, there is as well longer term commitments. Uh, there is industry where when you purchase goods or services as an initial investment to learn the customers, to put in place process, procedure, policies. So the longer term, the a longer term deal would then allow to smooth that cost over the time. So it means you would actually look at that as a lever. Um, and then and specifically when you talk BPO as example, I've, I've seen deals uh, significantly more attractive financially when you go from five years instead of three, because there is the initial ramp up cost, which is then goes over five years instead of that initial period. So that's an important one. Um, the, the, the demand management is an important level as well for procurement. Uh, then that doesn't help salespeople, generally speaking, uh, because that could be about stopping the demand or reducing the demand, uh, is that you just find an alternative. And it's very it's very common to do that in advisory and consulting. And, and I've dealt a lot with that, where you've got two part of the company doing similar projects, and you actually realize that well, the second part did not know about what the ref the other one is doing and you just consolidate that and they benefit from uh, the work that's been done on the other side. So they, you don't need any more of that uh, expertise outside. You've got it internally already. So that's about, about that, the uh, reducing of demand. Then competitive tension is an obvious one. Uh, you just go to RFP, you just negotiate, you just actually put additional competition. And it could be auction, it could be a number of things as well from just one-to-one -one negotiation to things which are more um, competitive by nature, and, and I've seen I've seen actually extremely interesting results in, in e auction uh, where you actually drive costs down in a very interesting way. You can't repeat that over, um, but but I've seen example even in the legal uh, business. So you buy legal counsel, a uh, number of hours and seniority and etc., and you actually put that into into an e auction mode. So that's one of the things you'd be using. 
Now, th these two are the ones which for me are important as well and, and too often overlooked, which are really about the commercial model and the part which is in-source versus outsource as well. Uh, in, in a number of cases, you, especially when you start building up specifications, you actually think about a service you want to buy and you don't realize that actually broadening the scope means you probably outsource part of what you do internally, but then it's going to create more value down the road. So that's one of the level procurement would benefit from using more. And that's where I think as well, some of the suppliers can help shaping the thinking of procurement and the thinking of the business by not limiting themselves to actually what's been asked, but as well trying to provide some more end-to-end -end solutions and ask the right question to get to that actually understanding of what could bring more value uh, in, in an environment than just purely what's been asked. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate a bit about the idea of the commercial model? What do you mean with, you know, different commercial model? And, and, and I think it's particularly true in the, uh, in the services industry is well, if you think about uh, BPO as an example, I think we've been or I've been outsourcing quite large parts of the um, end-to-end process around transaction uh, finance, account payables, book to pay, uh, some of those elements, basically financial accounting. And there's different ways of actually building those commercial models. It could be an, an output model where you actually buy a service and you say, well, I'm going to give you all of that. I'm going to give you the stuff and then I want a price. And it's a sort of fixed fixed price for an output. There is a number of models where suppliers would do that generally. They would come with an FT-based price. They said, you've got 10 people today. We take you 10 people. And over time, it's going to go from 10 to 9 to 8. So we'll give you the benefit of that. Now, it doesn't give the same incentive for the suppliers to actually realize that benefit because they've got that sort of commitment to just go down. But then it's not an output space. If you've got, if you acquire a new company, the volume goes up, you just have different type of complexity. So it's really how the services is priced is really what's going to make a difference. So sometimes you really want to change that paradigm and actually define what you'd be expecting in terms of productivity as well. So that, that's the kind of things I'm thinking about. Great. Now, let's uh, imagine the situation, put myself into the shoes of a supplier that uh, didn't quite deliver. You know, there was some flaws, there was some... Uh, average or below average type of performance? I mean, should they try to hide those weaknesses? Should they deal with it? I mean, what is your take in those type of situations? Um, well, that, that, that's a very good question. I've actually had that case relatively recently where actually the a supplier lost the deal because of that. Uh, and it was a BPO actually exercise where we were, were outsourcing some payroll function. And then the suppliers just had some relatively large difficulties in one country specifically and actually touch our CEO and our CFO. They just meet the payroll for those two individuals. Um, and for some reason, procurement was not aware of that. I think that our relationship to the business was not good enough to realize that they uh, actually failed. And then we just went together, put specifications, started the RFP process. And during the presentation, we just had the two finalists, that suppliers plus another one. And then that's where the question around the CEO and the CFO uh, payroll miss came up. And you could imagine how it's been perceived by procurement, how it's been perceived by the suppliers as well. They struggle to explain that. So for me, the, there, if you negative performance happens, Sometimes there is good reason, there is things that just go wrong and there is a cascade of events. J just be proactive, anticipate the issue, uh, come up with an explanation and a response prepared, and then just monitor the timing. Because it means if you disclose it, you're going to be in control of the discussion. And then you can return the focus on the negotiation itself of the specific deals you are talking about and the overall value proposition, instead of just well, trying to swim across explaining what you did wrong into the uh, into your previous experience that that's uh, for me never shy away from explaining it's just the wrong thing to do yeah yeah by the way i have a story on this one from this week just um, um when i do a training you know one of the indicator of success is the net promoter score let's say the question is would you recommend this workshop to your colleagues or friends and uh, I finished my influencing workshop. I thought that the workshop went extremely well. You know, it was for remote session. And when I look at the evaluation, they were a bit lower than usual. 
I said, well, you know, what's up? You know, I thought that the workshop went so well. And when I asked the people, will you recommend this workshop to your colleagues? Then I get a lower number versus the past. So, you know, uh, then you say, well, you know, that's uh, what's happening with this trend. And then uh, as I read the comments of the people, then uh, uh, two or three people were open enough in their comment to say, I'm not going to recommend it to my colleague because the training was so good that it gave me a competitive advantage with those influencing techniques. So maybe I'm not going to recommend it to anybody else. <laughs> so I guess, you know, if you only look at the numbers, then, you know, it seems that uh, there is a problem. If you're able to provide an explanation up front about why the numbers are lower, then this may clarify why you know the net promoter score for this work should have been that lower because people saw the, saw the question as uh, well maybe i want to keep the competitive advantage through using this uh, uh these influence techniques okay yeah, no, that, that's uh, a very good point and actually back to my payroll example is that definitely you shouldn't look at the metrics only because their performance their slas if you look at their dashboards everything was green they've got a very high performance but then well missing the two most important individuals in the company pay slip was just a major <laughs> flow for them, basically. But but they were performing very well outside of those two misses that they had. Well, two two months in a row, actually, they didn't pay them, <laughs> which, which is not exactly what you want. Well, they had to go back and do advance payment, etc. But then everything was green. But in reality, well, yeah, there was those two things. And then they would have much better just highlighting that and saying, well, it happened, it's fixed now, and it's not representative of our overall performance. So you're right, don't, don't trust only the, uh, the number, just go, go one level beyond. Perfect. By the way, I do remind the people in the audience that they can ask questions. You know, I, I can keep going with the question, but I think it will be richer if we also get questions from the audience. So if you are negotiating with procurement, if you want to get uh, uh, Nicolas' insight on some of the procurement things, then, you know, let's take advantage of this expertise. Now, uh, let me go with one more question from my side. I mean, what could salespeople do to help procurement? Uh, well, first talk to them. <laughs> first talk to <laughs> procurement. Um, ask, ask procurement about thinking that went into some of the business requirements because that definitely would provide you a very good insights around the reasoning behind and how it's been structured. And it will inform as well you on the expected output that that's very important so just ask those questions now th there is another things as well is that simplicity always well procurement want to understand the real differences in between their options and quite often uh sales people want to share all of the information they will download everything they could they will give you all single answers and go into uh, so many level of details that the procurement person doesn't understand anymore what's important in everything they've shared so for me that's that's an important point is that the simplicity always will just focus on those three four things that are important in your proposal that's going to provide value that's going to differentiate you from your competitors and don't give me the four hours pitch just go from the 10 to 15 minutes because you know that as an average human being you can't have an attention your the same level of attention for an hour than you have for 10 minutes so just make sure you get that message in a in, in, a, in almost an elevator pitch, basically, in like those five bullet points, which are going to be important, and that's going to help me to understand what you are really offering. Uh, that's one. There is another thing which quite often salespeople overlooked until they are asked is customer reference and getting procurement people to talk to some of their peers that are using the same solutions in different industry, in the same industry. I think that's one of the things that I would recommend as well doing is if you want me to help, uh, if you want to help me to understand what you are offering me, let me talk to another procurement person in a different industry using you as a supplier, because that's then going to provide me a number of information, valuable information. Uh, now, as a procurement person, I'm not stupid. So I know you are going to provide me a, a customers where you've got a very positive experience and he's going to be delighted and everything you want. But at the same time, a procurement to procurement conversation 
on your offering is going to make a lot more impact than a sales pitch you are going to give me. So that that's another thing I would uh, I would think is is really helpful to do. And come come with that proactively, especially if your competitors in winning a specific deal are not making that, you are going to get additional points by doing that proactively. Okay. By the way, how do you behave when a salesperson asks you? What are the criteria for your decision? You know, what is the weight? What are the different criteria? What is the weight of uh, to make your decision? Do you disclose or not? Um, well, I guess it depends on the situation. It depends on what you are trying to procure. The more complex the deal is, probably the more open you want to be about what you are looking for. Uh, we, we've done recently a lot of uh, what we call request for solutions, which is basically you describe a problem, but you don't tell the supplier what solutions you are looking for. It's for them to structure their team, to provide the right technology to support, uh, to solution your problem. And that's typically the kind of cases you want to be relatively open about what's important to you. And it could be operational efficiency you are going to gain out of that internally. Uh, it could be cost, and it's, it's quite often cost anyway. I think that um, salespeople usually know that it's, it's done by cost, but it's not always a prime one, basically. Uh, and then it could have a number of other elements which are important around resiliency and reliability of some of the services which are going to be delivered. So definitely in those kind of environments, you would disclose that. In other cases, you probably don't want to answer that question. Say, well, just uh, just make your best offer and don't worry about that. Uh, it's in between the business and us to decide the solution or the service or the good that really fits what we want. Now, it's it's not uh, it's not one um, one size fits all, definitely. Okay, perfect. Now we see that we are starting getting a question from the audience and. Uh, I want to start with the one from Ilya, a, br a brilliant head of sales and one of my former students at the University of St. Gallen. And his question is, what are the top three procurement tips that uh, sales may use in negotiation? The, the three procurement KPIs, sorry, that sales may use in negotiation. The free procurement KPIs, um, <laughs> I think they're, well, no, actually, I, I was going to say cost reduction come first. Actually, it's a bit unfair to say that. I think the it all goes back to what the overall procurement objective is about in that specific deals. And, and if you look at, and I'm going to go back to Thomson Reuters, who I worked for for a number of years, a lot of our challenges were around revenue growth and getting new product, getting new features. So we were really interested by having some access to some innovations, to some exclusive content, to the things that are going to make us uh, winning sales, winning revenue, and making us more competitive in front of some of our own competitors, basically. So I think that uh, for us, innovation was extremely important. So that was one of the KPI that some of our suppliers used and used successfully actually talking to us basically to exclusivity to innovations and then well the more innovative the better and then relaying that actually to some of our own challenges basically that that was one procurement now cost is is always one as i said I've never worked in a procurement organization that had not a cost objective. It, it just doesn't exist, even though you've got, well, some industries which are more prone than others to actually manage their cost because of their margin and it's critical for them. Even, even companies with very high margin cost is part of the procurement KPIs. They don't, don't trust people who are saying different. It's always an important element and it's always one that's going to make be part of the of the decision at the end. And, and I think the third one is actually whatever you buy at the end of the day, it needs to be there and it needs to be at the quality required. So the sort of operational delivery model is important, whether it's a good, it's quality timelines, etc. It's if it's a services around how you do you measure then the quality of the services delivered. So that's an important element. It's like the that that trio which you find or I find important. Excellent. Now we have another question which uh, is coming from a procurement person. And the question is, you know, uh, how can you avoid that salespeople works with the business? 
in the back is a question from Thomas. And the question is, how do we make sure that the, the, the salespeople you know, are not working directly with the business and then coming to procurement at the last minute? I mean, how can you deter this type of behavior? Well, it, it's the life of a procurement person to fight that every day. Um, I think it's a, it's a message that uh, is actually built over time by procurement leadership across the organization and by individual in procurement when they interact with stakeholders. I think I said earlier, a lot of the costs are actually built at the uh, specification stage. So when the stakeholders is actually trying to define what he needs and, and whether it's a good or a service is not different when you actually start building up the specification that's where the cost is and that's a message that a procurement professional really need to get to the business to get to stakeholders to say well don't start talking to suppliers before we have at least an initial conversation now you can have conversation with sales directly doesn't really matter but then you need to let us know and how it's progressing so don't exclude us because down the road it's going to be more complicated it's going to be more complicated to get to the price you want it's going to be more complicated in terms of risk mitigation of legal obligation so the earlier you put those, some of those elements into the conversation the easier it's going to be to interact with the suppliers down the road so that that's definitely for me a lot about communicating early engagements messaging that back to uh to different area of the business now it's and it's one angle i think that's sort of the proactivity around that now there is an important element in procurement is as well how much are you going to deliver how are you going to create value for that business for that stakeholder so you can't go only and tell them you want to be engaged early you as well need to prove you are going to make a difference when you are engaged early so you need to prove the fact that whatever you are going to do is going to be for a business benefit and it can be cost readability innovative solutions you have an expertise as a procurement professional that the business generally don't have so make sure that you actually use that expertise to bring value to them great great point uh, let's continue with the question from the audience there is one from eric which is uh, how to know if procurement function is a strong decision mandate in the specific negotiation um well ask the question <laughs> ask the question to procurement, uh, not directly like that, obviously, but ask the question about how the decision is going to be made, who needs to be involved in that decision, what kind of time frame we are talking about. So ask that question to procurement. And I would recommend as well, ask that question to stakeholders too, to say what's procurement role in the process? How are they going to get engaged? So I think it's, uh, it's by questioning and asking, you are going to get an answer. That's one part. There is another one as well, it's during meetings, generally, you could as well have a feel when you do presentation, whether it's Q&A, you get a feel as well of what procurement role is. Uh, in some instances, it might be more tactical and making sure the deal gets through. In some instances, you could really see procurement having more of a leadership role. So as well, read the attitude and the behavior when you interact uh, during any of the meetings you have with the, uh, the team you are facing. Yeah. Let me say as a general comment also, Eric, is that uh, in every negotiation, there are three components we should take into account, you know, the substance, you know, what we are negotiating, the relationship, you know, that's something that is going to also enable, you know, to continue working and the process. And the process is one of the elements which is often neglected. So understanding the decision power of the other party is one of the process elements that you should keep into account and questions is the way you know, to get this insight about how the process is going to look like. You don't want to be in a situation where you, know, you negotiate with Jacques, 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 you make your very best offer with Jacques because you, know, you make an effort but hope to close and then Jacques is going to come well, okay, thank you very much for your offer, Eric. Let me discuss it with my boss and we may come back to you. And then it means that probably you know, you're going to go around for have another round of negotiation because the boss of Jack is going to come, is going to ask you something else. So do clarify those process elements at an early stage. Um, why don't we continue with the question from the audience? Because you know there are so many coming that, uh, uh, you know, it may be worth to explore this further. Of course, you know, just uh, uh, to be clear with you in terms of timing, we are going to stop at two o'clock uh, 
uh, European time, Central European time. So this gives us another 20 minutes, which will give us the opportunity to answer you know, a good number of your questions. How about for the building industry, how will the procurement team correlate with the tendering team? The specification and law order are defined, the specification are all very technical, please advise. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a very specific question. That's the one I'll probably struggle a little bit to answer because I'm not coming from the building industry. Uh, even though I actually worked uh, into industry where we actually built data centers, where definitely there is a lot of specifications which are defined by architect, product manager, technical specification, which are relatively difficult to read and understand. Um, and, and for sure, I'm not a specialist into data centers and a building, but then you still have a Pokemon expertise, which is important because I think there is some negotiation skills, some contractual elements. There is delivery models where you could actually play a role too. You are not going to influence that much the technical elements of those conversations, but you are going to influence the operational delivery, the timing, the quality of the delivery. You're going to help making sure there is the right KPI and SLAs around some of those contracts. You are going to make sure that every party that needs to be involved during the process, like legal, are going to be involved too. So one of the things which is uh, interesting in procurement is that you could work across a number of industries where there's a number of common skills and expertise you could be leveraging, even though you don't understand fully what is actually the end requirement. Um, you, are, you need to have a broader understanding, obviously, you can't really come in and understand nothing about it. So make your research and make sure you are prepared anyway. Look at the industry, look at some of the elements. But every technical detail, you're not a specialist and don't try to be a specialist. I've actually seen some procurement people trying to ask clever questions. And you could really see that when they asked a question, they didn't fully understand the question and the answer was far out of their technical reach anyway. Thank you. Now let's look a bit about the role of time in negotiation. You know, there is a question from Thomas again. You know, is the deadline of the business requirement a lever that the sales team use frequently? As the date comes closer, the leverage for procurement lowers and they need the service procurement procured. Well, procurement people are large sales people. We've got long memory. Uh, so if you play the watch too much with us, uh, we are going to remember that down the road and, and might do the same. Well, uh, joke apart, if you uh, want to build a successful partnership, uh, well, definitely timing is an important element, but don't play too much with that. Uh, I think it's probably going to be detrimental about building a, that win-win relationship or that relationship is going to help you uh, to get to more successful deal down the road. Now, yes, sometimes timing can be uh, an issue. Now, I've seen very large deals where there was timing issues, both sides, and we actually make conscious decisions to extend the timeline on the procurement side, which actually uh, was unexpected from the sales team. And we actually had conversation with the businesses about that, uh, which means as well that some of that leverage just went away. And as I said, we've got long memories, so we basically didn't like that much uh, the suppliers putting pressure on us about specific timing. I think it's probably not a, a good negotiation leverage overall to use if you want to be there for the longer term. Yeah, great. Now, to understand a bit more about the impact of timing and the different levers that happen around timing, then uh, I put on the chat uh, the information about an article that I wrote about the art of timing in negotiation. This may help you understand, you know, how different components of timing can or cannot be used effectively in a negotiation. So, yeah, very good. Good. Uh, let's move to a question about uh, cartels. How to find out if a cartel is formed during the negotiation or bidding process? Uh, that, that's an interesting one. Uh, I, I think there is a different thing. There is what we call consortium buying, which is perfectly legal. It's organized. There is a framework around that. And consortium buying is definitely things you do for commodity. And, and it's done in every industry. I've, I've done that with laptop and with office supplies and where you actually pull your requirement with some others and you buy it together uh, as a consortium. So the, and that's, that's in the open. Now, cartel is something which in most of the countries would be illegal because it's mean, well, fixing prices based on some back-end conversations. Um, 
Well, it's, I, I think if every supplier is coming exactly at the same price, there is very definitely something really weird about it, unless it's driven by an index or by any kind of stock exchange, which could be the case. Uh, if um, you actually see that one supplier is always going to come lower than the others and the others are not going to try to compete at all, which is always a bit weird. It means they are under capacity and they don't want to serve you, but it could mean as well that they are actually sharing the business and avoid competing uh, in between each other. And there has been large uh, well, cartel in the past, which got actually uh, caught by... Um, by the police or by uh, and, and went into the news and they have been uh, it got judged. I think the uh, well there is probably less and less of that now. Now that's something which still exists and and I think if you perceive there is a cartel, I think it's worth definitely having conversation with your legal team to just advise on what kind of course of actions you should be taking with that and if it's worth doing it. Yeah, just let me share an example. As the French government was making a tender for uh, uh, some network solution, you know, like the 5G kind of solution, they decided to do their uh, tendering process and parallel negotiation at night just to avoid that there was some leakage of information coming from uh, other people uh, into the government. They had all the people into different rooms in an hotel and uh, everything was happening during the night in the hotel to minimize you know, the possibility that uh, there would be enough information sharing taking place uh, between uh, the people within company and with the people in the decision-making committee to get inside information. Now, of course, you know, it's a bit of an extreme type of example, but these are kind of the things that do take place in real life to uh, minimize or prevent the creation of a cart cartel or a coalition or any kind of privilege, kind of access to information that may take place and may uh, hinder an effective bidding process. Good, let's go for a question from Gemma, which is a classical one. You know, how to deal with the fact that you're seen as a very expensive supplier. You know, how often as a supplier you get the challenge, you're too expensive. There is somebody else who can do it lower than you, is it cheaper um, than you, so. Now, well, <laughs> that, that's a good point. And I think that's, um, that, that's a very good question. I would say that it's really about value and return on investment. I think it depends what uh, industry you are in and what kind of services or goods you are selling. If it's a commodity, I can buy exactly the same everywhere else, get the same um, service beyond and etc. That's going to be difficult to argue, obviously. If you operate into the services industry, then that gets a bit more tricky because that's where you actually can position yourself around the operational efficiency, around how you could be um, creating more value than some of your competitors because the price is only one element of the deal. I think it's important as well to understand that procurement, especially when you come into more complex area, would have um, the capability to measure return on investment and would look at the total cost of ownership and not focus on the price itself. So if the price is higher, but you are able to demonstrate that your total value is going to be offsetting that small price difference, then you win the game, basically. It, it's really about that. It's really about positioning the value to the business, articulating that value to the procurement team. Now you've heard me saying that earlier, simplicity always wins. So don't try as well to make smokes and mirrors, but really come to points where actually you think that's why you are more expensive and there's good reasons for that. And overall, the value is going to be bigger than some of your competitors. Great, Nicola. And let me add some additional perspective, Gem, on, on this topic, because, you know, after spending over 20 years in procurement with leading multinationals, I became a professor and I set up my own company. So I'm now doing the sales job as I sales my negotiation and influencing training, you know, to a number of, of companies. And guess what? Probably I'm not the cheapest, right? Now, uh, I guess that uh, when procurement and sales negotiate, there is a uh, a fight where procurement people are trying to shift all the suppliers to be a commodity. Now, you know, the ideal position for procurement is that you have suppliers that are very similar to one another and you can choose whoever you want. 
and your job as a salesperson is instead, you know, to be perceived in the mind of the customer as a monopoly, to be perceived as the company you want to work with. So you have to find a way to differentiate yourself through branding, to quality, to business model, to customize solution for your customer so that in the mind of the customer, you become the monopoly. They say, I want to do business with Gemma's company. Let me find a solution with her. So if you ended up being challenged too much on uh, the expensive element, probably you didn't do enough job of selling the company on positioning the value add that you only can bring. Now, we are towards the end of our, uh, of our LinkedIn life. Let me ask you one last question, Nicola. Have you seen recurrent mistakes based by salespeople? I mean, can you share you know, with our audience some of the things that uh, you've seen that uh, you know, probably salespeople should avoid when uh, negotiating with procurement? Um, yeah, I think there is several things that, that comes to mind. Um, coming with no preparation is, is, is an obvious one. Uh, you don't even know who is going to be in the room. You are not prepared to deal with that specific of my company, basically. So that, that's the first one. I've, I even had a supplier that uh, came in and called me by someone else's name, which was not a very good start when you call me Stefan and my name is Nicola. That doesn't look really good. Um, and, and that was an interesting one because actually that supplier was seen as potential winning a large potential deal. So I actually got involved because I thought that was going to be a critical deal, which he didn't even read the invite and he didn't read the email that went with, which was saying that the CPO wanted to get involved. So we were willing to actually have, uh, well, their value articulated basically. So he come and prepared, unable to explain the value uh, that the deal was proposing that the deal was really uh, providing us versus some of his competitors, basically. Uh, so that was a large failure. The lack of preparation is the largest one. Uh, that's one. Um, I think viewing the negotiation as a fixed buy is, is as well one common mistake. Um, th there is definitely, and I think Giuseppe, you've done several uh, negotiation workshop on that, is just try to increase the size of the pie. And I think you just broaden your mind, think about the different elements that could be included, think about uh, what else uh, is important to the person in front of you, what else you could be bringing as value. So don't, don't just uh, resume uh, or make a proposal on what you are asked. That, that's uh, that's something that not enough suppliers are doing. Now, don't waste my time as well. Try to make it relevant anyway. I think it's it's important too. Um, you, you talked earlier about the person-to-person -person negotiation. Uh, there's definitely sales people that sort of lack empathy. Uh, they just don't treat the person in front of them. They're just here to sell something and they will talk to you like they would talk to anybody on the street. So that, that's one, uh, one thing I've seen happening uh, relatively often. Uh, to, to be fair, less and less as well. I think the, uh, because there has been more competition in the industry I am in, I think you've got less and less of that. I think people got more prepared and they are more better trained as well. They've got some influencing skills workshop done and they come in with much better articulated value. But that's still something which, um, which uh, I've seen happening. Um, quite often it's like we're winning the economic case but just losing the relationship trust element and, and sometimes the difference are so tiny you end up going with a team you are more comfortable with um, then well I, I think probably the last one um, would be to believe that the decision has to be made now in that room sometimes we just call for Q&A for final negotiations for whatever we call that well don't believe that it's actually all done when you leave the room. Make sure you do the right follow-up You with stakeholders, with procurement. Make sure that actually if there are still open questions, you um, definitely answer those in emails afterwards. So don't just drop the ball on the meeting is over. Even though we told you it's a, it's a final negotiation, there, there is always um, a bit of follow-up needed. So the lack of follow-up is, is probably another one. Great. And maybe uh, to conclude, let me uh, build on this point about, you know, building this connection, you know, personalized message, you know, uh, and uh, on the opposite side, you know, the lack of empathy. Uh, one of my former boss said, you know, with things being equal, 99% of the times 
you do business with people that you like. And with things being unequal, still 99% of the times you do business with people that you like. Now, maybe, of course, you know, the 99% uh, is extreme, but uh, do remember as a sales professional the importance of the relationship, the importance of building the connection, because at the end of the day, we are all human and we all enjoy working with people with whom, you know, we may relate and uh, with whom we may have uh, a nice discussion and a nice relationship. And by the way, this was the case today with Nicola. Thank you very much, Nicola, for sharing this insight and providing a lot of value to our audience. Uh, so a pleasure to have somebody with your level of seniority of experience, you know, a CPO that comes and share with us on LinkedIn Life. I hope uh, this uh, provided the uh, ideas and insight to all the people that are listening to us. Uh, the recording of this session will be also available on my profile. All the very best. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you for your kind words and look forward to reconnect with you next time. And uh, let me tell you, by the way, if you're still there, that our next LinkedIn Live will be the 15th of April at uh, 1 o'clock European time is about uh, question and questioning in negotiation. All the very best. Thank you.